You hear me? You hear me? Yeah, you're good. Okay, thank you. Okay, I apologize for the delay. Welcome and thank you everybody for participating in this uh, um, get together. Um, it's a big chizik, it's a big chizik to see how the community comes together. Even though we may not dominate the same shoals, we may not see each other on a day-to-day -day basis. But when uh, somebody goes through a Sorrow, a tragedy, and everybody's there together. It's a big chizik for all of us. As was mentioned, the it's it's supposed to be Le'ilu Nishmas um, Ayileb, but he was a Yelid, and he was a pure Nishama. He does not need an Ilu for his Nishama because he was perfect. We need an Ila and Eloi for Anishamas in order to how in order to deal with this, in order to come together as a community, to be machazik each other, to be machazik the family, to be machazik the Rebbeim, the yeshiva. So um, and that's basically when when someone goes through this, that's what we have is each other. We have each other to to strengthen each other. And that's what we're gonna try and do tonight. Learn a little bit together. Some things that we can use to improve ourselves as, as great Baruch Hashem as Klai Yisrael is. Um, we can learn together, maybe things that we could improve before Shavuos. Is a, this is the time of, in between Pesach and Kabbalah Satayra, it's the time that we're supposed to uplift ourselves, purify ourselves before Shavuos when we, we got the Torah, and uh, let's hope that we could together learn, and it should be a schus for, for the Nisham, which we said doesn't need the schus, but it should be a schus for ourselves and for Klal Yisrael, and, and we should all end up seeing uh, B'suras Taivas and Yeshuas and the um, Another Another thing that was mentioned that Baruch Hashem, the the families have gotten together to try and donate the kindergarten classroom in Siyach Yitzchok um, in memory. Um, and let's hope that the Torah and the Midas that are going to be learned there will be a schus for his neshama. And um, I don't know if somebody's going to post a link to that, or I imagine there'll be, there'll be links posted, but it would be a very nice and befitting thing that there will be a memory in the, in the yeshiva where he went to, um, forever until Mashiach comes. Okay, so um, first we'll start with a, a, a preface, a hakdama, just to talk to something uh, to something that because of what's been going on, let's just discuss that. And from there we'll hopefully continue to to uh, take some lessons from what it is that we have to do. So there's a question that people are asking, whether it's the right thing to ask or whether it's the wrong thing to ask, but it's worthwhile to discuss, which is we wonder why is Hashem doing these things? Why, why is Hashem, why are these tragedies happening? Why? What is the calculation? What is Hashem? What is Hashem's thinking? Now, really, that question is not a proper question, which 
hopefully will discuss and by not having this question actually makes us makes us happier but we're human and we have these questions and we'll try we'll try and discuss it there was an interesting custom in the uh, in Yerushalayim with the Chaver Kadisha and and uh, this was said over last week after the tragedy in Meron they had a they had a, a custom where after they finished with the funeral, any funeral, they sat down and they made a lachaim. They drank they drank they drank some alcohol and they said lachaim to each other and they made a bracha baruch atah Hashem alakinam alchalom shakol niyabed vara that everything was made with Hashem's words. So they were asked why did they do that? Such an interesting, strange custom. So after after a funeral, to sit down and drink. So they basically answered that what happens by funeral? Everybody asks questions. Why did it happen? Maybe we should have done this. Maybe we should have done that, et cetera, et cetera, things that humans ask. And, and they said, this is really not, this is not, this is what we call apicorsis. It's heresy to do something like that. We're supposed to accept whatever Hashem gives us without any questions. Hashem wanted it this way. There was nothing, there's nothing to change, there's nothing to do. So after the funeral, they get together and they say a blessing, they say a bracha to Shahakol Niyabadvara, that everything comes from Hashem to just say, we ask these questions, but we understand that everything is from Hashem. Whatever Hashem decides, whatever Hashem does is for the good, as difficult it is, as it is to see it. And therefore, we're just acknowledging that after the funeral is over. That being said, there are answers to the questions that, are, that people ask, and we'll attempt to, to see what the Gemara says, and, and from the lessons that we could take from that, that will help us in our Sholem Bayis, in our fam with our families, children, and, and hope to keep the future generations on the, on the correct path. So to answer the question of people, why are these things happening? Why does Hashem do these things? So there's a Gemara in Erevin, a fascinating Gemara in Erevin on, on Yud Gimel Amid Beis. Now just a little history. So most of the disagreements in the Mishnah are between Beishama and Beishul, right? They were the great yeshivas and they, they had disagreements, they had disagreements, and a large portion of the disagreements of what we go with in halacha are disagreed upon by Beishamai and Beishil. So the Gemara says that for two and a half years, Beishamai and Beishil had a disagreement. One said that it's better that a person should not have been created. It would have been better if we were not born. And the other said, no, it would have been fine. It would have, it's good that we were born. And they debated this for two and a half years, which is quite a long, quite a long debate. And at the end, it says, Nimnu Vigamru. They counted, they took a vote, and it was decided. Now, Nimru Vigamru means that it was a unanimous vote. It wasn't a, you know, 51-49. It was 100% mm -hmm. in the direction that they decided, which was, Noyach Loy Adam. It would have been better for us not to have been created. So, and this is, so this is unanimous. This, these are yeshivas who disagreed pretty much on every halachic issue. And after two and a half years of deliberating, they decided that it's better for us not to have been born. So when you think about that, that means it's unanimous that we should not have been born. That may answer the question of why these things happen. It's not going to answer why they happen, but we can't have any complaints why these terrible things happen if everybody was in agreement that we should not have been born. The, the reason why we should not have been born is because these terrible things happen that are almost that are almost unfathomable and so difficult. Why should we? Why should we have been born? Which is what everybody agreed. To, to, to say, that's what they agreed, that we should not have been born. So then how can we complain that these things happen if 
we should not have been born. And that's why we should not have been born because of these things. So that is, that's an answer, a, pa, a slight answer, at least to, at least understanding that these things were meant to happen clearly. Otherwise they would not have said that it's better that we should not have been born. The, the question that becomes that we get from this is, so then why were we born? Why were we born? If everybody, if both Beishamah and Beishilo, the greatest, greatest of in the history of, of Judaism, of Klai Yisrael, said that we should not have been born, so now they're the, they are the deciders of what should be in the world, right? The Torah is, is the, the, the uh, guide for how to live life. So if they said that we should not have been born, so why were we, why were we born? Right? That's a that's a very valid question. This is a question that's that's debated a lot, and we will let's put that aside, and we'll we'll get back to that. Okay, now let's let's bring up something else, something that we say um, in davening. If we look in the in the Shir Shalyoim, in the in the song of the day that's said at the end of davening, when people are running out, but it's and that's why we read it over very quickly. But if we read on the on Wednesday, the one that we read on Wednesday says as follows: Ashrei Hagever Asher Teyasrenu Ka. Praise is the person who Hashem punishes. Umitayras Chasel Amdenu, and we learn that from the Torah. Okay, so praise is the one who gets punished, and we learn this from the Torah. What, why, why is it praised for somebody to get punished? So it continues, The reason why people get punished and the reason why it's praiseworthy to get punished is to save them from, literally the translation is to keep it quiet for them, are the bad days, right? To, keep, to save them from the bad days. Because a Russia, somebody who's wicked, will be, will be buried into the depths and we, somebody who's gonna get punished will be saved from going down to these depths. So therefore the Pasuk is saying that it's praiseworthy, right? Ashray is a very strong word in Tehillim. It says praise is the person who gets punished and that's from the Torah, okay? That's one. In the song of the day from Shabbos, it says the it says the same thing, or very similar. I'll just read that, which is, it says, "Ish ba'ar lo yeda." Somebody who doesn't understand. Let's just let's just translate it as that. Does not know. Some ish bar, somebody who is uneducated, doesn't know. Uchsil and a fool lo yavin azos does not understand this concept. That what? That befroyach rishayim k'moy esav. When rishayim grow like grass and they prosper. Kiyatzitzu kol poyeli oven. And people that do bad things gain, which is the classic question of why the good things happen to bad people and why the bad things happen to good people. He shomdom adeyad. It's to make them be punished forever. Okay, so right here from these two, these two Prokim of Tehillim, these two parts of Tehillim that we say on, the, on a weekly basis, basically say that the reason why bad things happen to good people and the reason why good things happen to bad people is because we are not, we're looking, we have to look at this in the long term. We have to look at this as the next world. And the more suffering one has on this world, the better the next world is going to be. And the better it is on this world, then it possibly can be that it's not gonna be so great on the next world. So if this is not so confusing as to how do we go about living our lives, then I don't know what is. Because something good happens to us, are we supposed to be happy? Maybe we got our reward in this world. If something bad happens to us, it sounds like we should be happy, right? We got our punishment in this world. Or maybe we're so great that something good happens to us, we deserve it. 
and maybe if something bad happens, then we, we deserve the punishment. Whatever it is, basically what comes out is we have no idea when to be happy, when to be sad. You can be, you can have the greatest thing happen to you. And if you read this, this what it says in Tehillim, it sounds like you should not be happy. Matter of fact, I heard second, second from one person to the next, meaning I've heard this from the person who heard this, that the daughter of the Chavetz Chaim, when something good happened to her, would say, there, there we go, there goes my next world. Something good happened to me. Now, I'm not saying we should, we should do, we should be on that level. But the bottom line is, this can create a very confusing, a very extremely confusing um, life and what our attitude should be. We're supposed to be happy, but we don't know. We don't know when good things happen, when bad things happen. So the answer to these questions, again, we're dealing with two questions here. One, why were we created if everybody said that we should not have been created? That's a why we were created. And also, what is our attitude towards life supposed to be? Are we supposed to be happy when good things happen, sad when good things happen? It's confusion. So the answer to both questions is that if we look at this world and take this world at face value, then it's not worth it to be born. It's just, it's just not worth it to be born. The pain so far can, can the pain can outweigh the, the good that it's almost not worth, um, it's almost not worth starting. To bring it down to a mundane example, you know, we work five days a week. Most of us work for five days a week and we get off for two days a week. If you ask somebody if he could just not work and just not just not have not have vacation days and not have work days, or have five days of work for two days of vacation, which one would they choose? I would imagine most would choose, I don't need the vacation and I don't need the work. Just just leave me, just leave me be. I don't need, I don't need, um, don't give me the good and don't give me the bad. All right. But that's if you're looking at you're looking at it for this world. That but that's not what we're here for. We're not here for this world. We're here for the next world. What happens in this world is extremely temporary. When we have something in mind for the next world, then that was very much worth our while to be born. We are, if we have that in our head, then this makes a little bit more sense. So the reason when the Beishama and Basil are disagreeing over whether we should have been born and they came out that we should not have been born, that's for this world. But for the next world, it is most certainly worthwhile to be, to be born if we do, our, we do properly what we're supposed to do, which is what the Gemara in Erevin ends off by saying, it says, and now that we were born, the Gemara says, now that we were born, so we should review our, our what we do, we review our actions, either in the past or what we're gonna be doing into the future, so that we will have a good next world. And that's what we have to keep in mind. We have to keep in mind that it's not, we're not here for this world. This world does not make any sense. It makes no sense whatsoever. Um, and it's, but if you say that it goes for the next world, then, that, then it starts making a little bit more sense. So the question is then, if it's supposed to be for the next world, so how do we go about making ourselves be eligible, eligible for the next world? So what happens to us is unfortunately, unfortunately is deep down, I'm not so sure. I mean, we all believe, we believe, but we have to believe 100%. If we would believe 100%, then a lot of the issues that we, that we contrive in our head and that come up are, are gonna go by the wayside. Again, we're not talking about major, what, what the gathering, what we're gathering for here, that's something that's, that's above and beyond. But the trivialities of life that we get so stuck up on and we get, st we get stuck with it and we can can't get past it and all these things are strictly coming from us not having belief that whatever happens in the world is from Hashem, every last, thing in the world comes from Hashem. When we get up in the morning, we stub our toe and we start grumbling and mumbling. If we just say, Hashem, for whatever reason, wanted me to stub my toe 
and we start our day off that way, Hashem, whatever your calculations were, that's fine by me, then it would change us. It would change us. And that's, that's what we have to have in mind, that when we, any little thing that happens to us is coming, coming from Hashem. And what are we supposed to, how are we supposed to live our lives? So there's another Gemara in Saita. The Gemara in Saita says that there's a Pasuk in Devarim that says, one achare Hashem alekechem telechu, you should go after Hashem. That's what we're supposed to do. Go, we should imitate Hashem. Whatever Hashem does, we're supposed to imitate. So the Gemara says, how can you possibly imitate Hashem? How can you follow? Hashem is just fire. It's, he's not a person. So how do you imitate Hashem? So the Gemara says, we go after his midas. After whatever, what, what Hashem does for others is what we have to do for others. So the Gemara says, just like Hashem clothes people that need clothing, we're supposed to clothe them. The same way Hashem takes care of the sick, we have to take care of the sick. The same way Hashem takes care of people that lose relatives, we have to also try and take care of them. And so on and so forth. And whatever Hashem does, we have to imitate Hashem. So basically, what the Gemara is saying is that if we want to have successful lives, we have to put everybody else ahead of us. Hashem did not create the world for himself. Hashem gave us the world for ourselves. Hence, he gave us 613 mitzvahs, which a lot of the mitzvahs, when we think about it, don't necessarily make sense to us. Why can't I meet together with dairy? Why can't I uh, eat non-kosher, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Many are the opinion that the reason why Hashem said these things is simply to give us more reward for the next world. That's what he gave it to us for. Hashem made this world for us. So he doesn't need us to be doing things for ourselves in this world. What the Gemara is very clearly saying is that we need to give to others. We are in this world strictly and simply to give to others. And we have to believe that there is a reward for every slight little thing that we do, any slight mitzvah. The Shari Tshuva says, Rabbi Yano says, that how come there's different punishments? He doesn't ask it as a question, he has a statement. He says, there are different punishments for, for different things that we're not supposed to do, right? You eat, you eat not kosher, there's this type of punishment. You do this, we're talking about not, not um, eternal punishment, we're talking about punishment from, from when, we, when we were in control and we had our own Bezdin and Sanhedrin. Right? So there's different punishments. How come there is no reward? There's nothing, no mention of reward for any of the mitzvahs. It doesn't say if you keep Shabbos, you get this. It doesn't say, you know, there's different levels of reward that you're going to get. And the reason for that is, is that if Hashem told us what the reward is going to be for each individual mitzvah, then what's inevitably going to happen, because we're humans, we're going to stick with the mitzvahs that provide us the most return on our money, to use, to use that example. So, so Hashem purposely did not tell us what our reward is going to be, so that we would treat each and every mitzvah and try and do it to the utmost, because we have no idea which small mitzvah is going to give us the most reward, and therefore we'll approach all mitzvahs with the same with the same uh, with the same seriousness. There are a couple of mitzvahs that are mentioned, and in the Torah where it does mention that you will get um, very much very you should get you will get a lot of rewards. Two totally separate, different mitzvahs. One have nothing to do with the other, but they both say similar things. One is having respect for parents. Having respect for parents, then it says you're going to have long days. Long days, um, and the long days does not mean long days in this world. It could mean that too, but it means long days in the next world. And a strange, I don't want to say strange, but it's really out of the blue that um, chasing away the mother bird from on top of the egg, it says there are also major, major rewards for that. So one seemingly is... is Honoring parents, we could understand that the Torah says much, there's a lot of reward for that. That's hopefully a lifelong um, mitzvah, and it requires work. Chasing away a mother bird, all it requires is a stick, and you just chase the bird away. The same or similar reward. That's why, that's those 
That's why it's saying two so totally separate, seemingly non-related things to show you you have no idea. Because if it was, if you asked us which one is going to be the big reward, honoring parents and chasing away a mother bird, we would say, of course, honoring parents, but they're equal. So that's what we have to have in mind because we unfortunately, unfortunately, we, we don't truly, truly believe that there's that there's such unbelievable reward waiting for us to when uh, when we do mitzvahs and especially when we do mitzvahs for others and doing for others is is imitation like we said it's imit it's you're imitating Hashem which is what Hashem wants us to do um, there's and just to show an example of how of how these things are two examples of how these how this works is that there was a mitzvah in two weeks ago's parsha two mitzvahs actually, well, well, it's not a mitzvah, it's telling us what not to do, is that we're not allowed to harbor resentment against anybody, even if the person does something bad to us, and we're certainly not allowed to take revenge. Okay, now what does it mean? What does it mean, revenge? That means you, um, Rashi brings this, and this is a Gemara, it says you, you went to your neighbor to borrow a tool, and your neighbor said, sorry, you can't have the tool. The next day, the neighbor comes back to you and says, I need to borrow a tool. So what's what's our initial reaction going to be? I hey, you. I'm not giving you the tool. You didn't give it to me. That if one does that, then they are they did an avera, and that is not allowed. And the other option is you can say to the you say to the person here here's the tool, but just look, I'm not like you. You didn't lend me the tool, and I I am lending you the tool. That is also not allowed. Now, why? You would think, well, why? Why do I have to go lend my neighbor a tool if he didn't lend it to me? The Sefer Achinuch says very clearly is by, because by taking revenge, you are not acknowledging that Hashem is the one that caused your neighbor not to lend you the tool. It was not your neighbor. Yes. Should he have lent you the tool? That's his own business. My business is to know that I needed a tool yesterday at 5 p.m. and Hashem did not want me to have that tool. That tool was not meant to be in my possession five o'clock yesterday. Happened to be my neighbor is the one that didn't want to lend me the tool. That's fine. None of my business. That is none of my business. And if I have, if I have a problem with my neighbor because of it, that means I'm denying that whatever happens to me is from Hashem. Because if it's from Hashem, then we would accept it, right? If you believe, if you honestly believe, then you would tell Hashem, you wouldn't tell Hashem, you would just say, Hashem decided that I shouldn't have this tool. But by harboring resentment and or not giving the tool back, that means you are denying that Hashem had a hand in this at all. Also, the Gemara says that somebody who, another example, is the Gemara says that somebody who does avoid the Zorro, I'm sorry, somebody who gets upset or angry, kas is the word that's used, somebody who gets pekas is like he did avoid the Zorro. Now that's somebody getting upset. Many, many times when we get upset, kas, it's warranted, but but uh, we still, it's like as if we did avoid the zara. Why? So the answer after what we've just learned, the answer is very simple and very straightforward. If you get upset, that means you're not acknowledging that this is what Hashem wanted. Otherwise, why would you be upset? If you're being upset, it's as if you have another God. You don't believe in Hashem. If you believed in Hashem, then you would not get upset. If, if the, whatever the mundane, there's no reason to go into examples. We all know. We all know when we get upset, and it's if we get if we get so because then that is that's a denial. That is a denial of of this is what Hashem wanted wanted uh, to happen to me. So that's. That's that's the basic lesson that we have to know, and that's something that if we would if we would be conscious of this on a day to day basis, then we would have a much easier time being nice to people, being nice to our spouses, being nice to family, being nice to friends. Right? I mean, if somebody were to call uh, and say talk negatively about somebody, that's also a denial of Hashem. Hashem created that person. Hashem created that person. That person didn't create themselves. Hashem created them for whatever it is, with their good and their bad, right? 
by looking down upon them or thinking that we're better than them is again a denial. It's a denial of, of what of Hashem. And again, that's why we're supposed to be here in this world to give to others. And now we'll get to some, some practical that maybe we can take out from this. Just also there, you know, right? So we have to, and that is that cloud, God of Atara, that's what Rabbi Kiva said, that that is the rule, that is a, the, a, the, a major rule in the Torah is to love your friend like yourself. So what is the, what is the translation of Ahava, of love? So if anybody's gone to a Sheva Brachas to a wedding, they, they've heard that the word Ahava means, Yahiv means to give. That is true. But if you look at the Targum, of the translation on the side of the Chumash, Targum Onkelis, on any time the word Ahava is said, you can look at it in the Parshias of, I don't have the exact Sukkim on me right now, but you look at it in the Parshias of, of when the Avas, Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov were looking to get married, so it says that they loved their wives. The translation of love there means Rachmanus. It says Rachmanus, it means pity. Pity. Love means to have pity means to have pity on your friend, just like you'd want everybody to have pity on you. Okay, so now, when we go through difficult times, then it's, then we say, yeah, we understand, we, we say Hashem, Hashem did it, and we don't understand the ways of Hashem, et cetera, et cetera. We have to try and implement that into our day-to-day -day life. If we can take that and into our day-to-day -day life, say Hashem did this, and it's not anybody else, then we can take these lessons, which we're very good at when major things happen, and Hashem did this. But what about the small little things, right? If Chas B'Shalom, a spouse, ends up behaving in a way that we're not so happy with. So instead of having complaints against the spouse, say this clearly Hashem wanted me to have this situation. It's from Hashem. And then we'd be able to deal with it a lot easier. Same thing with children. A child spills, spills something on the floor. Now you have to clean it up, right? So you get upset. One who gets upset is, a, is not remembering and taking a step back that this is from Hashem. Hashem wanted me to have to clean up this mess. And we can go, we don't have to go through examples. We can sit here a whole night and go through examples. But what we have to do is from these major situations of these get-togethers, which we're very, or Hashem, very good at getting together and doing things together when there's when it's a time of need, we just should try and implement that into our day-to-day -day life. Meaning, and and then we'll will it will create a better home in our marriage, it'll get it'll create better marriages and it'll create better children because if children see parents that everything on their mind everything is Hashem it's Hashem they don't get upset now again this is we're just talking about in the utopian ultimate way we're all human and we're going to get upset and that's what it is but or like as they say in America it is what it is right but if we know what we're at least headed to and what we're supposed to do then this can can provide major major improvements um, in our life and this will teach children bitachon, and ultimately, and this is probably the most important point of, of all, is that it will, it will create happy people. Because when you put yourself in the mindset that everything that happens to me is Hashem, and Hashem is going to take care, whether I understand it or not, whether it's gonna work out in this world or not, then you're almost in a cocoon. You've created a cocoon where you are just, you're just happy because when you know that there's somebody taking care of you, then that just creates a happiness and that a happiness, it becomes effusive. It works on the spouse, it works on the children, it works on the rebellion. There's, that happiness just creates more happiness, which creates health, right? I'm not trying to put any therapists out, out of business, but it theoretically, a lot of, okay, obviously we're not talking about of situations that are of mental illness, et cetera, et cetera, in these major situations. But on the day-to-day -day basis, if we would just 
keep Hashem in our mind, then that would create us, they would create extreme happiness. The the Orchus Tzadikim, I don't have it in front of me. The Orchus Tzadikim has a has a chapter on how to be happy. And his main point, one of his main points of being happy, he says the to be happy is to have emuna and betachen, to have faith, just have faith in Hashem. If you have faith in Hashem, then you're always happy. He's, and he brings an example, a mundane example, that if somebody has a boss and the boss is working them very hard. So now, if you truly believe that this in this boss and you 100% trust this boss when he tells you that you are going to be worked hard, but I promise you, you will be taken care of at the end. You may not understand what's going on here, but I promise you, you will be in the best place afterwards. That person, if they truly, truly believe, goes to work happy with confidence that whatever this boss is doing, that is what is going to be the best for me. But when you don't trust that boss, and anybody who has a boss can, can understand that, when you don't trust that boss, and you think that that boss has other motives, then it becomes much more difficult, and you're unhappy with your hard work, et cetera, et cetera. That Dr. Sadiqan says the way we have to have it with Hashem. For those that truly, truly believe, it's pure happiness because what I'm doing and what Hashem is doing for me, ultimately I will be taken care of through the thick and through the thin. When there are cracks in it, that's when you get sad. And the truth be told, I imagine many of us know people who are extremely happy. And usually the people that are extremely happy, the word Hashem is not far or from their lips. It's not far from their lips. They're living with Hashem and they're happy. Uh, I'll just say one example, you know, for Hashem, we come from a well-to-do town and many, many collectors come from Yerushalayim to collect. Now, if somebody's coming to a foreign country where they don't speak the language, that I imagine would make a lot of us not, not happy. But I see them in the yeshivas and they sit down and they learn and they're making jokes and they're happy. And I, and I think to myself, what, what, what is going on here? But every other sentence is, Hashem, I came, I had to do this. Hashem is going to take care of me. I'm fine with it. Yeah, I have to go knocking door to door. I have to do this. I have to do that. Hashem is going to take care of me. Hashem is going to take care of me. And they're happy. And they're happy. So if we want to be happy, that's really what we need to do. It's, it's not easy. But we at least can discuss and know ultimately what we're supposed to be like. And, and therefore, we are going to be happy. And if we're going to be happy, then our families are going to be happy and our children will be happy. And we are going to create a better place. Just because there's supposed to be practical lessons here. I once saw from Rabbi Shimshon Pinkus, who, I mean, it's interesting that we're discussing the next world. His, after he passed away tragically, him, his wife, and a couple of children, an accident, his Torah was just spread over the entire world. It's almost like you saw that when Hashem says that you will have reward in the next world, it happened for him. I mean, he was a major Rav um, to begin with, and then he passed away. And, uh, but his... His, his Torah just went all over. So anyways, one of his Svarim, he says that his children go into the grocery store on a Friday or an Erev Yom Tif, and they get whatever they want and they put it on the bill. No questions asked. Why? Because the Gemara says that any money you spend on enjoying Shabbos and enjoying Yom Tif and Cholamayr and Rosh Chodesh, you get the money back. It doesn't come out of your calculations, meaning we get a calculation from Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah over exactly how much money we're going to earn and how much it's going to cost. And the Gemara very clearly says that spending for Shabbos, Yom Tif, Rosh Hashanah, uh, Rosh Chodesh, Halamayid does not matter. It doesn't count. So his kids went to the grocery store and did whatever, bought whatever they wanted. How, what greater way can you teach faith and betachen and Hashem than telling a child, go into the store and buy whatever you want. It's Lukovic Shabbos. Yes, of course, 
the kids then say, well, okay, can I buy a new bicycle for Shabbos? And then I have a new bicycle. No, so that, okay, well, this is supposed to really be halach a little bit, but it doesn't work like that. It would have to be something that's strictly for Shabbos. Like if you want a new watch, if that watch is going to be for Shabbos, then that's, that should not come out of the calculations. Be'ez Hashem, we have Rosh Chodesh coming up in two days, right? Take, take, take the kids, take them, take the spouse out. It's Rosh Chodesh. We get the money back. It doesn't come out. They say, well, are you sure about this? That's what it says. You want to, you want, you, you don't want to believe, you don't have to believe, but that's what the Gemara says. That's what we believe. Go, do it. And, and it's just a very simple, practical way of, of teaching, teaching betachen and the, and, and the family will see. The family will see that that you have uh, that you have full faith in what the what the chachamim say and what a, and what uh, and what Hashem says and and we and it's just a way of teaching that we are under the power of Hashem. He will take care of us, and whatever it says in the halacha, whatever it says in the Gemara, is what's going to propel us and what's and that's what's going to be and if we do that we will have as is Hashem um, much Hatzlacha with with life because that's a very healthy way of going through living life it's not it's not me when we take things into our own hands that's when we start that's when we start uh, you know doubting ourselves etc cetera, etc cetera. that's uh, but that's not the way it should be if we just put our our mind that it's from Hashem then, uh, and that that's what uh, that's what will take care of us, and that will create happy people. And happiness is an extremely important part of Yiddishkeit. If we're not happy, then that's not then that's not what Hashem wants. Hashem wants happiness, um, and that brings us to 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 the final thought, which is that there is a disagreement. For for on Yom Tif, whether what's what's the main the main part of Yom Tif? Is it supposed to be for us, or is it supposed to be for Hashem? Meaning, are we supposed to sit and learn Torah a whole day because we're not working and we're off, or are we supposed to eat good food and enjoy? So that's a disagreement in the Gemara whether it should be split or it should be either all for us or all for Hashem, whatever it is. However, Shavuos coming up as Hashem a week from tonight, Shavuos, all opinions agree that you have to have enjoyment if on Shavuot. You have to have enjoyment. Why? Because that's when we were given the Torah. Now, if you ask me, which don't ask me, but if you ask me, I would say if there's any Yom Tif, if there's any holiday where we should study Torah and not have enjoyment, it should be the, the, the Yom Tif of, of when we took the Torah. When we took the Torah, we should be learning a whole day as a representation of receiving the Torah. But no, that's not that's not what it is. According to all opinions, on Shavuos, you have to have extreme enjoyment. It, that's what must be. Why? Because accepting the Torah, you cannot be successful at studying Torah, a learning Torah, without enjoyment and without happiness. I happen to have seen this morning that the Chavot Chaim told one of his students when they, you know, when they leave for intercession for Ben Azmanim, they go home for, for the Yom Tavim, he said, you must be happy. If you're not going to be happy, then you're not going to be able to learn. And, and a main part of learning is happiness. Therefore, happiness plays a major role. And that's, and like we said, what enables us to be the happiest and then to, to show our families that we're happy, is by having full betachon in Hashem on the, the minor, from the most minor little things. We're supposed to have the full betachon in Hashem, and that will that will uh, make us as uh, Hashem. That will make us um, successful in in doing whatever it is that we want to do. So, again, just let's just let's just review. We're in this world. Not for this world. We're in this world for the next world. Yes, Hashem wants us to enjoy this world too, but push comes to shove. Ultimately, whatever happens in this world is meant for the next world, not for this world. We can't get stuck in the temporary things that happen in this world, as difficult as that is. 
but we are here for the next world. And what's our job in this world? Our job in this world is to help others and to treat others the way we want to be treated and to imitate Hashem by giving and giving. And how do, and how do we go about doing this? By having the full betachem in Hashem that whatever little thing happens to us is meant to be. And we teach that to our families and we teach that to our friends and to our um, kids, classmates, whatever, to anybody that's willing to listen. You just show that you're happy, that you have the token. And if we could all do that, as is Hashem, we will all be like that together, giving, constantly giving, giving, giving. And if it starts in our own immediate families, it will be, it'll just, It'll just be extended to extended family and then to friends. And then we know that Be'ezus Hashem will be Zaycha to Mashiach to Meherav Yameinu. And we should see no more Tsar. And we'll be all together Be'ezus Hashem in Yerushalayim to Meherav Yameinu. Amen.